Hey everyone, Baylor here. I got the idea to try and highlight some important people for Black History Month, but to do so in a way that highlighted who they were and what they accomplished in an objective fashion. When trying to decide who to spotlight, it occurred to me that the best thing that I could do would be to speak about people in fields that overlap with my own knowledge and experience. But even after narrowing it down to just people in my fields of expertise, and then just people in music, and then just guitarists. Once I sat down to compile a list, that list went well over 28 names pretty much immediately. One note when you're watching these videos, please keep in mind that I use TikTok for the easy creation tools, but it does mean that the video quality, the sound quality, and of course the screen orientation were all limited by what TikTok offers. Anyway, here are 56 guitarists, each one important to me. I wouldn't know about Blind Willie McTill if not for the Allman Brothers band. The story goes that in 1968, Dwayne Allman was laid up in bed with a broken arm, and Greg gave him a copy of Taj Mahal's first album to cheer him up. Jesse Ed Davis's slide work on Statesboro Blues is what inspired Dwayne to empty all the pills from his Corsetan bottle and take up slide guitar. Less than three years later, the Allman Brothers released their own version of Statesboro Blues on at Fillmore East. Blind Willie McTell's original version dates back to 1928 and sounds quite a bit different. He was one of a number of performing blues artists from the Georgia, Carolinas, East Tennessee area playing Piedmont blues, where the more well-known Delta blues kept at a steady pace with its bass and added melodies or chords on top of it, often with a slide. Piedmont Blues tried to emulate the left hand of a stride or ragtime pianist for the bass and play corded figures over the top. And Willie McTell was one of the best, getting gigantic sounds with a 12-string guitar. One final connection to the Allman Brothers. Willie McTell used to work as a car hop for a barbecue restaurant called The Pig and Whistle. He even used to perform under the name Pig and Whistle Red for a while. The Allman Brothers used to have band meetings in the parking lot of Macon's Pig and Whistle. Aside from Statesboro Blues, I think you should hear Don't Forget It and Come On Around in My House Mama. Blind Willie McTell. Speaking of 12 string guitarists, let's talk Huddy Leadbetter, better known as Lead Belly. I was introduced to Lead Belly's music very young in life, though I didn't know it at the time. For a good portion of my childhood, I lived with my grandmother and she used to sing Good Night Irene pretty much every night when it was time for bed. And when I met Emily, being the Nirvana fan she is, I finally got to hear their version of Where Did You Sleep Last Night. Lead Belly was an interesting person for a lot of reasons. Most interestingly to me, he was able to sing his way out of prison. True story, the governor of Texas pardoned him after Lead Belly wrote him a song. And this is after he was in jail for escaping jail. <laughs> His 12-string guitar work was technically impressive, but also immense, made even more so by the instrument he used. The Stella 12-string he used was gigantic. Look at that thing. It had a longer scale length than a normal guitar, 26 and a half inches. That meant that the strings were under significantly more tension than on a normal guitar, so the instrument had to be uh, reinforced with ladder bracing, it had a trapeze style tail piece, and he had to tune his instrument lower down to like D or C sometimes. Plus, Lead Belly used finger picks and a thumb pick. I'm betting you didn't need a PA to hear him in the back of the room. <laughs> Along with Goodnight Irene and Where Did You Sleep Last Night, I suggest you hear his version of the traditional House of the Rising Sun, New Orleans, and also Bottle Up and Go. Lead Belly. There's a tune that used to appear in the Allman Brothers live sets from the early days called Outskirts of Town. A slow 6-8 blues done in arrangement inspired by Albert King's recording of that song. But Albert King didn't write Outskirts of Town. Neither did Jimmy Witherspoon, Rod Stewart, Lou Rawls, the Everly Brothers, Ray Charles, Mel Torme, Count Basie, or any of the countless others who have recorded their version of Outskirts of Town one time or another. One of the most recorded tunes in blues history was written in 1936 by Casey Bill Weldon. And Casey Bill Weldon could play. Originally from Arkansas, but moved to Memphis, he was known as the Hawaiian Guitar Wizard because he played slide on a national steel guitar in his lap, like a dobro. His recordings were mostly with a band, which gave him the freedom to play guitar as a lead instrument, which he definitely did. He'd play fast, high on the neck, and he would play the changes. 
even over more complicated jazz and ragtime styles tunes. Unfortunately, there's not much known about the life of Casey Bill Weldon. He wasn't active in music for very long. His last known recordings were before 1940, despite the fact that he lived until 1972. Aside from Outskirts of Town, I'd say check out Go Ahead Buddy, Guitar Swing Take 3, and You Shouldn't Do That. Casey Bill Weldon. Whether you know it or not, you've already heard a bunch of Memphis Mini. Led Zeppelin's When the Levee Breaks, Jefferson Airplane's Chauffeur Blues, Donovan's Dig the Slowness, Mazzy Star's I'm Sailing, all written and originally performed by Memphis Minnie. Memphis Minnie, born Lizzie Douglas, was quite the badass. She was a street busker in her teens in the uh, North Mississippi suburbs of Memphis. She joined the Ringling Brothers Circus and then came back home to Beale Street in 1920 to join the blues scene there. Story goes, she won a cutting contest against Big Bill Brunzi, earned herself a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of gin. <laughs> She also appears on a bunch of old Memphis blues recordings in the 1920s and 30s, including some recordings by her first husband, Casey Bill Weldon. And even though there's historically some doubt about whether or not they actually were married, because there was another guy in town named Will Weldon and they think it's him, I suspect it probably was. Because on outskirts of town, Casey Bill Weldon sings about wanting to buy a frigid air since he don't want no Iceman always hanging around. And it just so happens Memphis Minnie had a song called Iceman. And it starts like this. I got an ice man in the spring, cold man in the fall. All I need now is to get my ashes hauled. Memphis Minnie could play sola delta style blues, slide and lead all remarkably well, meaning she could work on her own or with a band. Aside from When the Levee Breaks and Me and My Chauffeur Blues, check out If You See My Rooster Please Run Him Home and I'm a Bad Luck Woman, Memphis Minnie. It was probably You Gotta Move from the Rolling Stones album Sticky Fingers that first introduced me to the music of Mississippi Fred McDowell. Mississippi Fred McDowell had been playing hill country blues in and around Como, Mississippi since the late 1920s, but he never had any of his music recorded until Alan Lomax's field recordings in 1959. Hill country blues is less structured than Delta blues, uses fewer chords but with stronger rhythm and stronger melody with the voice and the guitar often doubling the melody. If you've ever heard the North Mississippi All-Stars, you've heard Hill Country Blues. And shout out to Luther and Cody, you guys rule. According to legend, Fred McDowell learned to play slide using either a pocket knife or a polished beef rib bone, actually. But he used a glass bottleneck for all of his recordings. Once Alan Lomax's recordings were released and people heard him, Mississippi Fred McDowell recorded several albums of his own, including a series of live albums from New York where he's playing solo hill country blues, but on an electric guitar. Plus there's an album with a small band called This Ain't No Rock and Roll, which apparently is something he was sensitive about. <laughs> Fred McDowell is also the subject of a short film made by the University of Mississippi in 1969 called Blues Maker. It's about 15 minutes long and you can still find it on YouTube. Fred McDowell's playing was expressive and often energetic. Some of his best tunes would start slow and build in speed through the entire song. Aside from You Gotta Move, I suggest checking out Fred's Ramblin' Blues and also his version of the Sonny Boy Williamson classic, Good Morning Little Schoolgirl. Mississippi, Fred McDowell. Brayto Ganib, Fixing to Die, the first song from the first Aquarium Rescue Unit album, was originally written and recorded by Bucka White. That same song, Fixing to Die Blues, when it was recorded by Bob Dylan for his first album, also has ties to John Fahey and the start of the 1960s folk revival. Inspired by Dylan's performance and wanting to record Bucka White himself, Fahey was able to find him by sending a letter addressed to Booker T. Washington White, brackets, old blues singer, brackets, care of general delivery, Aberdeen, Mississippi. You can hear quotes of Bucka White's song, Shake Em On Down, on both Hats Off to Roy Harper and Custard Pie by Led Zeppelin from Three and from Physical Graffiti. Also, on the 1966 John Mayle and the Blues Breakers album with Eric Clapton, the Beano Comics one, Parchment Farm is credited to Mose Allison, but it was originally written by Bucka White. And Parchment Farm, if you don't know, was the name for the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Another fun fact, Bucka White and B.B. King were second cousins. Bucka was first cousin with Riley B.'s mother. One thing to remember when listening to Bucko White's guitar playing is that his national steel is tuned cross note style, which means it's tuned to a minor chord, usually D minor. See, in cross note style tuning, the low strings are tuned kind of like an open tuning, 
making it possible to play bass figures with one finger. But the top three strings are tuned standard, so it's like kind of half open and half standard. Aside from Bucka White, the only other prominent guitarist of the time using cross notes tuning was Skip James. Bucka White's tunes were energetic and they were loose and they were incorporated the changes in the style of Delta Blues, but looser and with a stronger melody, kind of like Hill Country Blues. And of course, his playing was powerful, but it was also subdued and emotive. Aside from Fixin' to Die Blues and Shake Em On Down, I suggest listening to Aberdeen, Mississippi Blues and Atlanta Special. Bucka White. I made the decision to seek out Big Bill Brunsey's music largely because of the George Harrison album Cloud Nine, where he's mentioned in the song Wreck of the Hesperus. First thing I learned about Big Bill Brunsey, even before I learned, heard any of his music, is that it was his arrangement of Key to the Highway that Clapton used for the Layla album. The first Big Bill Brunsey album I heard was a collection of folk songs. It reminded me a lot of Lead Belly, actually. It'd be many years later before I heard any of his blues or dancehall numbers. Big Bill Brunsey, born Lee Connolly Bradley, was one of the most versatile musicians of the early 20th century. Even though he started as a country blues performer, through his career he recorded ragtime, folk, gospel, hokum, jump jazz, urban blues, a whole bunch, and prolific. In his lifetime, he recorded and copyrighted over 300 songs. His reputation as a consummate performer was so widely spread that in 1938, when John Hammond organized a showcase of blues and spiritual performances for Carnegie Hall, he hired Big Bill Brunsey to fill in for the recently deceased Robert Johnson. There's no one way to describe Big Bill Brunsey's playing. He was capable of everything from swinging folk accompaniments to absolutely blazing single-note jazz-style improvised leads not to mention the humorous and raucous Hokum and Rent Party recordings. Because of the huge number of sides he'd recorded in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, Big Bill Brunsey became a favorite of young musicians in the 60s folk revival and British Invasion. Aside from his version of Key to the Highway, I recommend two instrumentals from Big Bill Brunsey, Saturday Night Rub and Guitar Shuffle. Big Bill Brunsey. My mother's mother was born and raised in Skullbone, Tennessee. And this might be part of the reason why I feel an affinity for Sleepy John Estes, because he was born in Ripley and moved to Brownsville, which are two other small country communities uh, around the area of Jackson in West Tennessee. If you've heard the tune Leave and Trunk, it was popularly recorded by Tedeschi Trucks Band and Taj Mahal, uh, then you've heard at least one Sleepy John Estes tune. Though when he recorded it in 1930, he called it Milk Cow Blues. But since there were already quite a few other songs with the same name by like Kokomo Arnold, Freddie Spirell, quite a few others, Taj Mahal changed the name to Leaving Trump to avoid confusion. A fun thing about listening to Sleepy John Estes' recordings is the fact that he routinely recorded with a small band. Not just voice and guitar, but also piano, mandolin, and very often kazoo. John Estes' guitar work was concise but cutting. He liked to use open tunings, but not for playing slide. Instead, he would use double notes and close intervals to create these little jarring moments in his playing. John Estes's singing voice had a wavering, crying kind of a sound, almost like a blues equivalent to the high, lonesome bluegrass sound. As a result, though, people thought he was older than he actually was. And that ended up costing him work. When Alan Lomax began his field recordings, and when kids from the 60s folk revival began asking where they might find Sleepy John Estes, a lot of working blues musicians at the time assumed he had already died. Seeing his recordings from the 1930s already sounded like they were sung by an old man. <laughs> Aside from Milk Cow Blues, Leave and Trunk, I recommend checking out Special Agent and Sweet Mama. Sleepy John Estes. A lot of people don't realize how far back blues goes. Robert Johnson was only two years old when Blind Lemon Jefferson started performing. To put the timeline into perspective, if W.C. Handy is Johnny B. Good, then Blind Lemon Jefferson is My Girl, and Robert Johnson is Purple Rain. But despite the fact that Blind Lemon Jefferson's recordings are a hundred years old now, his tunes are still covered to this day. See That My Grave Is Kept Clean has been covered by everyone from Bob Dylan to Dream Syndicate to Fish. The movie Black Snake Moan takes its name from a Blind Lemon Jefferson song. And the plot is largely based on blues lyrics. 
One frustrating thing about trying to dig into the catalog of Blind Lemmer Jefferson is that his record company at the time, Paramount Records, did such a poor job recording his early sides. The sound quality, even compared with other records of the time, is pretty bad. But poor sound quality or not, Paramount Records did give Lemon Jefferson a new Ford, which he apparently used to travel all throughout the South. There are tales of him busking on street corners everywhere from Dallas, Texas to Johnson City, Tennessee. No easy feat for 1920s. When I hear Blind Lemon Jefferson's music, I can't help but think that when you compare it to the blues of W.C. Handy and Bessie Smith, his approach almost sounds like outsider music. The abrupt change between single note instrumental fills and big open chords during the verses, the uneven song forms, the absolute belching of the vocals, it all feels to me like an old timey version of Wesley Willis. But because of his charisma and his proficiency, Blind Lemon Jefferson became blues's first solo star. Aside from See That My Grave Is Kept Clean, listen to Matchbox Blues and Jack of Diamonds. Blind Lemon Jefferson. The song that taught me how to play solo country blues on acoustic guitar was Fishin' Blues. Originally written by Chris Smith in 1911 and originally recorded by Henry Thomas in 1928. But of course the version that I heard growing up was the first song on the 1971 live album The Real Thing by Taj Mahal. While it's true that the majority of Taj Mahal's work is with decidedly non-acoustic bands, it's also true that he's done a good amount of recording both solo and with world music artists. It's also true that because of Taj Mahal, I was introduced to the music not only of Chris Smith and Henry Thomas, but also Bo Carter, Blind Willie Johnson, Reverend Gary Davis, so many others. And yes, Taj has had some amazing guitarists in his bands over the years, including Ry Cooter, Jesse Ed Davis, and former United States Congressman representing New York's 19th District, John Hall. Don't make the mistake of overlooking Taj Mahal's abilities on the instrument, though. Taj Mahal has a deep pocket, good tone, good technique, a strong sense of dynamics, playfulness, creativity, and he always, always serves the song. One of my fondest memories was getting to take Astrid, my kid, to see Taj Mahal and Keb Mo at the Montreux Jazz Festival. I don't think I've seen a bigger smile on Astrid's face than when they started You Don't Miss Your Water Till the Well Ones Dry. There are few people alive today that have done more to introduce country blues to new generations than Taj Mahal. Aside from fish and blues, check out his duet of catfish blues with Tumani Diabate and Colored Aristocracy from Giant Step. Taj Mahal. More than any other folk or country blues artist, Elizabeth Cotton has become part of internet culture over the past 10 years or so, based solely on the number of videos I've seen circulated online. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that most of you watching this have seen the video of an elderly Libba Cotton playing freight train, you know, from her home on her couch. As a guitarist, the thing I find absolutely fascinating about watching Elizabeth Cotton play is what she calls cotton picking. See, she's left-handed, but she taught herself to play on a right-handed guitar, strung for a right-handed person, meaning that the bass notes are played with her two fingers and the melody is played with her thumb. As a finger picker myself, when I watch her play, it does funny things to my brain. <laughs> the other amazing thing about Elizabeth Cotton's story is the fact that she learned to play at a young age, but then she gave it up to raise a family, you know, have a husband raise a family, and the, she only would play occasionally to uh, accompany the, the choirs in church. It wasn't until after her daughter was grown and out of the house that she took up music again full time at age 60. Her music is much more American Appalachian folk music than it is, you know, country blues, along the lines of like Henry Witter, the Carter family, or Pete Seeger. In fact, it was Pete Seeger's aunt, Ruth Crawford Seeger, who rediscovered Elizabeth Cotton after Seeger's daughter, Peggy, got lost in the department store where Elizabeth Cotton was working. In 1958, Elizabeth Cotton recorded a hugely influential album called Folk Songs and Instrumentals with Guitar, primarily songs she'd written as a teenager, but never recorded. Aside from freight sharing, check out Wilson Rag and Shake Sugary. No, not that Shake Sugary but you could probably guess where the dead got the name. Elizabeth Libba Cotton. There are some singers out there, especially the gospel shouters, that can just 
absolutely scare the hell out of you when they start singing. Which might be the point now that I think about it. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be in the room with Blind Willie Johnson when he got on a tear. Must have shaken the rafters. Going back to Dylan's first album, and by the way, can you tell where I'm getting a lot of my inspiration? Tells you a little something about my childhood, I suppose. The, the song, In My Time of Dying, is Dylan's version of the Blind Willie Johnson song, Jesus Make Up My Dying Bed. And something that I think is immensely cool is that Blind Willie Johnson's song, Dark Was the Night, was included on the golden disc, the one that Carl Sagan and Androyan compiled and affixed to the outside of the Voyager Deep Space Probe. That's very cool. <laughs> Blind Willie Johnson's musical style might be largely blues inspired, but his heart and his voice was all gospel. He was a performer that held absolutely nothing back. In fact, there's a story that comes out of New Orleans that the local police arrested him because they thought his street performing was so impassioned that he was trying to start a riot. <laughs> and that puts Blind Willie Johnson in the same category as Stravinsky, as far as I'm concerned. And despite the fact that we only have about 40 or 50 of his songs recorded, Willie Johnson was widely known at the time as someone who had a deep and diverse catalog of tunes at the ready. Aside from Jesus Make My Dying Bed and Dark Was the Night, I suggest checking out Mother's Children Have a Hard Time and you're going to need somebody on your bond. Blind Willie Johnson. I don't know that there's much about Robert Johnson's music or legacy that I could tell you that you don't already know. I mean, for most folks, if they only know one country blues performer, it's Robert Johnson. But by the same token, in no universe would it be right for me to leave Robert Johnson out of a list of guitarists who were important to me. I first got the King of the Delta Blues cassette probably my sophomore year of high school. At the time, the very thought of being able to learn anything about what he was playing seemed absurd. In Robert Johnson's hands, the guitar almost sounded like a different instrument. It was watching John Hammond Jr. perform Robert Johnson's music that finally allowed me to kind of crack the code and learn some of it myself. I think there's already a lot of common knowledge out there about Robert Johnson, so rather than just give you stories about the numerous covers in rock music history, or the legend of the devil and the crossroads, or his death by poisoning, let me tell you a few things you might not know about already. First of all, his style. If all you've ever heard of country blues is Robert Johnson, you might not know that what you're hearing is an amalgam of several different musical styles that were popular at the time. Delta blues primarily, but there was also Piedmont blues, like They're Red Hot, and there were a couple of crooning tunes in there, like From Four to Late. The exact location of Robert Johnson's gravesite is something in dispute as well. Many researchers believe that he's buried in the graveyard of the Mount Zion Baptist in Morgan City, Mississippi. But there's a group of uh, musicians from Atlanta that used a photograph of his burial site and tracked it down to a little chapel behind a church in Quito, Mississippi, or Quito. I don't know how you pronounce it. But interestingly, recently there's been new information that's come to light that suggests that Robert Johnson might be buried under the pecan tree by the Little Zion Baptist Church in Greenwood, Mississippi, the town where he died. And finally, if you don't know, uh, the blues guitarist Robert Lockwood Jr., uh, his mother and Robert Johnson were, let's just say, close friends. So if there's someone alive today that knew him best, it's Robert Lockwood Jr. My favorite of Robert Johnson's tunes are 3220 Blues, Last Fair Deal Gone Down, and They're Red Hot. Robert Johnson. In like 1996 or 1997, I drove to Jacksonville to visit family. And while I was there, I got the privilege of getting to stay with my Uncle Chris and Aunt Debbie. I loved staying with them. The house was inviting, it was fun. Derek, David, and Dwayne were great kids, and little Lindsay was very, very cute. And even though Derek was still living at home, technically, he was also touring like a demon out, you know, two or three hundred nights a year. But I remember this particular trip because Derek and I stayed up most of the night watching videos of music performances that he had accumulated over the years. Uh, one of the standouts was concert footage of Sun House, which of course explains the Derek Trucks band recording of Death Letter on their 1998 album, Out of the Madness. If there's any one artist whose story completely embodies the entire Delta Blues phenomenon, it is Edward James' son, House Jr. Born in Clarksdale, Mississippi, he started working 
as a Baptist preacher in East St. Louis, but left the church at age 25 to become a full-time blues performer. Two years later, he ran into Charlie Patton and Willie Brown in Lula, Mississippi, the pair that arguably invented Delta Blues. Paramount Records began recording Sunhouse Sides in 1930, meaning he started traveling up north to do recording and, and performing sessions. And one of those early sides was Walkin' Blues, later recorded by Robert Johnson. Alan Lomax recorded Sunhouse in 1941, but by then Sunhouse had slowed his pace of performing and soon after he moved to upstate New York where he worked for 20 years as a railroad porter. And that's where he was working when he was rediscovered in 1964. And starting from then he toured extensively, played the Newport Folk Festival with Skip James and Bucka White, played the Montreux Jazz Festival, recorded live albums from London and from Seattle, and by the early 1970s he was performing with Buddy Guy, but he retired again from music in 1974. Aside from Death Letter and Walkin' Blues, check out Dry Spell Blues and Grinnin' In Your Face. Sunhouse. <laughs>